There was a bit of a delay. There was a bit of a lag that was experienced by a user just going out to the internet. Now that user complains, of course, it's the network, uh, the network's slow, all the things. This problem, it wasn't super huge. It's not like the person was sitting there waiting with a spinny wheel for minutes and minutes and minutes. But this example is a snapshot of something that you may see out there in the real world. And I'm gonna show you my workflow of how to find it. That's brilliant. You gotta be able, you have to do this for yourself. Yeah. No, no amount of watching these videos out there, everybody, if we can just have a real sidebar, you've got to take Wireshark, open up these captures and dig through them on your own. Yeah. If you're just watching this video, you're getting something from it. But those of you that downloaded that PCAP and are examining it, if you hit up my channel and do this, if you if you check out Wireshark and how to configure the screen and these Delta times, if you're doing that work, it's gonna help you get the most out of it. And this is gonna become a part of your thought process. Okay, so you need Wi-Fi. Are you gonna live dangerously and connect to a free Wi-Fi access point? You need to be really careful connecting to free Wi-Fi because you don't know if that's actually a legitimate Wi-Fi access point or a rogue Wi-Fi access point. I personally would be very careful just connecting to free Wi-Fi or public Wi-Fi out there. If you do need to connect to public Wi-Fi, I personally would only do that if I'm running a VPN and my VPN of choice is Proton VPN. I've been using Proton VPN for a long time. I started using it based on the recommendations that are found in books such as these and the discussions and interviews I've had with both hackers as well as cybersecurity experts. Proton VPN, Proton Mail have been highly recommended by people that I've spoken to in the cybersecurity space. The moral of the story is, do you trust the Wi-Fi that you're connecting to? Because hackers can very easily set up rogue access points. So in my case, I would never use a public Wi-Fi connection unless I really had to. And if I do need to use it, I would make sure that I have my VPN enabled and running. And the VPN that I would use once again is Proton VPN. Big shout out to Proton for sponsoring this video. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with the amazing Chris Greer. Chris, welcome. It's great to be back, David. Thanks for having me again. You're the guy I always talk to about packets. And you have this saying, and I don't want to take it from you, but something about packets that don't lie or packets don't lie, something like that. Yeah, you're going to see that around the packet world. The packet sphere is people say packets don't lie. And there's a good reason for that. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Looking forward to this. So for everyone who hasn't watched our previous videos, I've linked a whole bunch below. Chris is the person I always talk to when I really want to see what's going on on the Y, if you like, or in the air, if you're using Wi-Fi. Chris, you, just for people who haven't seen our previous videos, tell us a bit about yourself. You do this for a living, right? You help companies troubleshoot their networks, help with threat hunting, that kind of thing, right? Yes, that's exactly what I do. So I'm a packet head, and that's why you see this shirt on me, packet head, because I enjoy looking at packets and trying to find the answer to problems. Now, one thing that got me into this space actually goes into that phrase, packets don't lie. I used to be a network engineer. I was running around a network trying to find the answers to mysterious problems. And especially when I was getting blamed about the yep. ever so common phrase, what is it, David? It's always the network's fault, right? That's it. The network's slow. The network this, the network that, the network's dropping, the network, all these things. So as a network engineer, I found myself trying to troubleshoot these problems and I would go to the end of my experience, end of my skill level, and still wouldn't be able to find the root cause to some of these mysterious issues. Now, especially the ones that were intermittent. Sometimes it was the network, we were able to resolve it, but there was always these pesky, weird problems. So what I found is that there was these ones that I would work with some of my colleagues that developed the art of packet analysis. They were able to come in with Wireshark or Ethereal at the time or another a type of packet analysis tool capture some traffic, get down to the wire, find out what was really happening on the wire, and then they were able to find root cause. I was always blown away. Like, wow, that is amazing that they could capture this traffic. And it always looks so crazy. It looks like you're walking into like an airline cockpit. There's so much there. And you're like, what's important? What, what should I be paying attention to? What does that button do? What does that button do? That's how I felt when I got started. But then over time, as I started to understand traffic and how to leverage it as a very important data source, I too was able to see how to use it to resolve network problems or to better understand cybersecurity incidents. So again, for everyone who's watching, we can only cover so much on my channel. But Chris, you are, have over 100,000 subs on YouTube now, and you go into crazy amount of depth on your channel. So for everyone who's watching, please go and subscribe. 
to Chris's channel, Show the Love. But Chris, you also have courses and a whole bunch of other things, right? Yes, I do. In fact, uh, getting back to how I got here, and we've covered this on your channel, and also I talk a bit about it on mine, is in addition to learning the art of packet analysis, something I really wanted to do was help others learn it too. Yeah. Uh, I don't forget what it felt like when I first got started with all of this. And I hopefully communicate that in my content that you're going to see on my YouTube channel, if you go check that out, or any of my Udemy courses or any of the material that we've collabed on, David. Um, but it's really important for me to try to help others get up to speed yeah. on how to use packet analysis. And that's because I think it's such an important data set. Back to our original thing that we said, packets don't lie. So I know a lot of you out there, the viewers, you're out there trying to troubleshoot mysterious things, or you're trying to better understand how this whole networking thing works. Or if you're on the security side, what does an attack really look like on the wire? Yeah. What does an IDS IPS system look for? Or, hey, you're studying for a cybersecurity certification or a networking certification, and these questions keep coming up about TCP flows or what does this little uh, value do within a Wireshark trace? Or if you see a, a packet trace come up, you have to be able to read and understand it. And so that, that's really been a, a goal of mine to help as many people as possible learn as much as possible about packet analysis and doing that with Wireshark. I love it. But Chris, you've got a demo, right? Because I want to actually see you do it. And for everyone who's watching, I hope you enjoy the demo. But again, Chris has a whole bunch of these kind of demos on his channel. So go and sub. But Chris, take it away. Show us, you know, your, I'm, I'm hoping it's an example of you know, why packets don't lie. Yeah, exactly. And that's, let's get to it. Let's get to an actual demo. And for me, I don't just like showing you what I see in this packet trace. I want you to be able to follow along yeah. with me. So I'm going to go ahead and show you where you can uh, download this PCAP. You can get the uh, link down in the description down below. You can download it off of my GitHub and you can follow right along. So let's do that. So the link in the description down below is going to take you to my GitHub and you can go ahead and download this Lab1 Greer Bombball. It's not the network. PCAP NG. So all I got to do is just come over here and we're going to hit the little three dots and we can just download that content or pull it down any way you'd like. While you're there, you can peruse through. You can see some other different files that I use on my channel. You'll notice if you go and then you check out some of the content on my channel, I'm often coming back here and showing you where to download the example. So let's have everybody do that. Glad you created a GitHub. That makes it much easier. Oh man, so much easier. So David, as I walk through this PCAP, I want to show you the top five things that I look for to pinpoint problems in a PCAP. Wow, say that five times fast. We followed Fong to the defunct futon factory on 5th. <laughs> say that five times fast. But there's five things that I usually look for as a part of my workflow, and I want to break them down to you one at a time. So That's the great. first, I examine the TCP handshake. So let's go ahead and start off with that. So, okay, so download Wireshark. Open up that file that we're sharing with you, and now let's get to it. Now, why are we talking about this specific file first? There was a bit of a delay. There was a bit of a lag that was experienced by a user just going out to the internet. Now that user complains, of course, it's the network, uh, the network's slow, all the things. And I just want to pick out a few things that I look for when I'm troubleshooting a problem like this. Uh, David, there's a lot of different things that can go wrong. Yeah. where an end user can experience performance problems. There's not any one thing that I can tell you right now, oh, it's always this, because that's not true. There's a lot of things that it could be. But what I want to show you is my workflow and how to that's get great. to the biggest causer of delay. So does that sound interesting? That's great. And I just want to confirm, this is a real world example, right? Yes, it is. Now, this problem, it wasn't super huge. It's not like the person was sitting there waiting with a spinny wheel for minutes and minutes and minutes. But this example is a snapshot of something that you may see out there in the real world. And I'm gonna show you my workflow of how to find it. That's brilliant. Okay, so first thing that I do, and you've seen this if you ever stop by my channel, and absolutely if you've seen me here with David, my friend David, as we've dug through different PCAPs, and that is we got to capture the TCP handshake and understand a bit more about, about this flow from that. So let's start there. So first packet. Client, clients initiate sends, okay, clients start connections usually. So I can see 10, 0, 2, 15. In fact, I don't really even want to look at that as, a, um, uh, as an IP and the, this server over here as an IP either. I want to show you a little trick that I use sometimes 
And I've been using it a lot more lately, so I'm kind of in the habit now. I'm going to come up here to Wireshark Preferences. And if you're following along on Windows or Linux, then you're going to find this, uh, this uh, interface. If you go over to Edit and down here at the bottom, that's where you're going to find Preferences in Wireshark. And there's just one little preference that I'm going to change. If I come down here to Name Resolution, and by default, Resolve Network IP Addresses is unchecked. I'm going to go ahead and check that. Okay, so let's go ahead and activate that. And for those of you that are watching, if you have any of these other guys checked down here, let's go ahead and uncheck those just for now. Okay, just for the purposes of this walkthrough. This is where we start using DNS, and this is where Wireshark can actively go and resolve those names using active DNS or resolve them for DNS traffic that's contained within the, the trace file. Don't worry about that. Right now, I just want to click Resolve Network IP Addresses. If you look like mine, then we're good. I'm going to say OK. Now I'm going to come back here into my PCAP, and I'm going to come to this first one, first packet. going to right-click it, and you see Edit Resolve Name. Okay, I'm going to click that, and I'm just going to type in. There's this little toolbar that appears, name. I'm just going to call it Client and hit OK. That's nice. So you see now, instead of that IP address, now I see the word Client. going to do the same thing on the other side. Destination, Edit Resolve Name. Now I just right-click that, that uh, IP up there. And I'm just going to type in server. Okay, so now I've got client server, client server, That's client nice. server. Well done. Yeah. A little nicer when I'm dealing with IPs that aren't on my environment or new things that I'm seeing just to get my head around it. Especially useful, David, when I'm troubleshooting with IPv6 and Ish. I have these huge, massive IP addresses yeah. and I don't want to see all that. I just want to know who the client server is. So that's, that's how you can do that. Now, this is going to be sticky for this PCAP until I either come back up here. One way that I just like to remove this, and this is just my workflow. I can go to edit resolve name, and I can just remove the name client and hit enter, and my IPs come back. Or I can go uncheck that uh, checkbox that we activated in the name preference, and then that will let me uh, get my IP addresses back. So anyway, a couple ways we can do that beyond what we'll talk about here. So client goes to server, 25 milliseconds later. This is my delta time. Now, I'm going to go ahead and link right here. Maybe we can have a card show up that links you to a Wireshark setup video that will help you orient yourself and get the same kind of information that on your screen that I see on mine. This is a delta time column. It shows you the amount of time in between packets. Also, you'll notice that my sins are bright green and you can see my TLS handshake packets are that aqua color. So these are some settings that you can adjust with Wireshark. We've definitely done that here on this channel before. And there's a link quickly to my channel where I show you how to set that up real, real quickly. All right. So 25 milliseconds, SYN goes out, SYNAT comes back 25 milliseconds later. That right there, David, is something that I store in my brain. That's my network round trip time. Basically, that's latency. Latency as perceived when this actual user was interacting with this application. Some, if from a network engineer's perspective, I might say, ooh, you know, I can just bring up a terminal and I can ping the, the server and I can yeah. measure the network latency. Yeah, but if I do that right now, that tells me the latency now. Yeah. Where this tells me the latency that was then. And it's different traffic. And it's different traffic. This is a TCP port 443. This now, uh, it, it could alter the amount of delay that I see along the way, depending on packet inspection and what's going on. And so is that's that where good I or have bad? It. That's the question, right? Is it uh, the client was complaining that it was slow, the network? That's a good question. So is that good or bad? Right now, uh, let me ask you this. Do you think as a human being, do I worry too much about 25 milliseconds? No. Right. So right now, that's not bad. I'm not worried about that. That's not why they called me. That's not why my customer is, you know, punching their screen because yeah. things are so slow and buffering. And it's also, but, uh, it's, it's like, um, what's the baseline, right? Because if you've got fiber, your expectations are much different to someone who's on like a dodgy cell phone network in the middle of nowhere or satellite or something, right? It's all expectation, expectations. But I mean, I can't imagine someone complaining for that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, that that's the better question right there. It, rather than is it bad, is, is it normal? If this is an intermittent problem and the problem comes and goes, do you see 25 milliseconds when there's no problem? Because if you do, right there, I can remove that from my troubleshooting. That's not root cause yet. All right, David, we're going to go into the next thing. This is the second thing that I look for in a PCAP when I'm looking for performance problems. First of all, I'm looking at the handshake, but specifically within the handshake, I'm also going to be interested in, in a couple of things, and that is my TCP options. Okay, so options 
are things that are only exchanged in the TCP handshake. Once they're exchanged, it's done. They don't happen again. So let's take a look in this handshake. Let's go ahead and go to client to server and everybody can join me. If you come down here to the lower left, this is where we've got our display going here. And if I come down here to options, this is only exchanged in the TCP handshake. So right here, my maximum segment size, my SAC permitted, and timestamps and window scale. So there's four options that the client is basically saying, hey server, these are the parameters that I would like to work with in this TCP conversation. So now, hey server, what can you do on your side? Now the reason why we do this, David, just to go into TCP a little bit of history. So TCP is pretty old protocol, or at least the original TCP when it came out. I don't know, can you guess when the original TCP RFC came out? I can't remember, it's 80s or something, isn't it? Or 70s, I can't remember, it was a really long time ago. So would you believe that RFC 793 came out in 1981? No, I'm not going to tell you how old I was, and I don't want to know how old you were in 1981. And I'm sure some of the audience weren't around just yet. But yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so TCP has been around a while. So over time, what's happened is one of the things that's been adjusted is these options. It's allowed us to extend the lifetime of TCP to get more out of it, to make it more efficient for today's networks. Now, right there, I think that's pretty amazing that it's been around for 42 years yep. or longer, depending on when you're seeing this. But TCP really has staying power in a reliable connection-oriented protocol that does the job well. That's why it's still around. However, it's got some weaknesses that these options help us to overcome. So when two clients connect, that's one of the first things that they do is they establish the, the nature of the TCP relationship. What are we going to do here? So the client is giving these options to the server. So do this with me, David. Check out these, these options. Maximum segment size. This is the client saying, hey, don't send me anything larger than 1460 as a payload. That's my maximum segment size. That does not count the TCP header, the IP header, the Ethernet frame, just the payload. Now, next, selective acknowledgement is permitted. Thumbs up. Great. Timestamps, don't worry about it. Not going to talk about it. But window scale. Now, what window scale does is that allows me to take this window size here and greatly increase it. Because this window size value right here is just a two byte value. You can see over here on the right, when I click on window, over here on the right, these two bytes that are highlighted, yeah. that feel is only two bytes long. The maximum number that it can be in decimal is 65535. What that means is basically, hey, David, if you and I are sending data to each other, you can only have a maximum of 65,535 at once in flight on its way to me. Which was fine in the 80s, but not now. 100%. Back in 1981, no big deal. But now you're in the UK, I'm in the United States. Let's just say we had a gig link across the Atlantic Ocean with 150 milliseconds of latency. Yeah. 65K is nothing. Yeah. We would be, you would have to send me data so many times and experience that network latency that things would take forever to transfer. So for that reason, we, we uh, saw TCP evolve, if you will, to this window scale option. So now what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, David, when you see my window size, multiply it by 128. So that results in the calculated window size, which Wireshark does for us. This number here is the real calculated window size that's an internal value Wireshark is just doing me a solid here. It's just helping me to um, know what that number truly is. Yep. Okay, so I send those in flight, right? Server comes back. Let's notice what the server has. Now, what do you notice that's different, everybody? If you go to that second packet, server comes back, and I see some options, or rather, I see one option. Server's saying, okay, great, 1460. I can also accept maximum segment sizes of 1460, but what do we not see here? Uh, that like multiply, multi, multiply by 128, right? That's it. It's not using a window scale. It's not using selective acknowledgement. Timestamps, eh, I don't really care about right now. But those other very important options, in fact, Wireshark's kind of complaining about it. The SIN packet does not contain a selective acknowledgement permitted option. Hmm. Ooh, no good. So this means that I'm talking to a device. This is one thing that's strange here. I'm talking to a device or a middleware box or something is coming back with this uh, This SYNAC doesn't have a, a window scale or selective acknowledgement. So that's kind of interesting to me for one. So this client, what that means is this client and the server for that matter, 
When both sides don't support an option like window scaling, then neither side gets to use it. Yeah. So right now the client is saying, oh man, David, oof. I gave you a multiplier of 128. You're stuck, in the, you're stuck in the 80s, David. You're stuck in the 80s, David. Fine. We'll use 80s language here. Now that might mess me up because I'm not optimized for yeah. 80s TCP. Yeah. So you're, you're making me go back to the 80s? Fine, I'll do that. But we can't use this window scale. We can't use selective acknowledgement. Now, selective acknowledgement, that's a whole other conversation. We can link to another video that talks about selective acknowledgement or maybe uh, fuel for a future video, David. That's a whole big topic. That'd be good. Yeah. In fact, if you'd like to learn more about TCP selective acknowledgement, please comment down below. How's I that? like that. You're becoming so a real sit- YouTuber, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Trying. <laughs> Trying. All right. Um, hang, ra- hang around with you long enough. That might happen. <laughs> So sin goes out, options. Sin out comes back, only one option. So right there, think about this, David. How how many packets am I in to this pro, this PCAP? Yeah, two, right? One each way. I'm two. I'm two in. And I've already found something that looks weird. Now, how do I know that it looks weird? Because I've done this a lot. I've seen a lot of handshakes. Yeah. That's why packet analysis, really, just real talk, if we can have a sidebar for a second. Sure. You got to be able, you have to do this for yourself. No, no amount of watching these videos out there, everybody, if we can just have a real sidebar, you've got to take Wireshark, open up these captures and dig through them on your own. Yeah. If you're just watching this video, you're getting something from it. But those of you that downloaded that PCAP and are examining it, if you hit up my channel and do this, if you if you check out Wireshark and how to configure the screen and these delta times, if you're doing that work, it's going to help you get the most out of it. And this is going to become a part of your thought process, right? Okay, so now that we've looked at the handshake, I'm going to take you to the third thing that I look for when I'm examining slow things, when I'm looking for slowness. Now, by its nature of even saying slow, I'm looking for where time is being spent. Yeah. Where is time going? Now, right now, I'm just on a single thread conversation, but if we're not looking at a single conversation, that's where I just want to say right-click, conversation filter. If this was a real-world PCAP, I'd want to do conversation filter TCP to just focus in on only this conversation, yeah. all right? Now, this is just a single 64 packets on a single conversation. So that filter that I just set did nothing. But for those of you out in the real world, yeah. when you're looking at a conversation, you got to set a conversation filter for what I'm about to show you. All right, so the next thing that I like to do, where is time being spent? That's why a delta time column is so important. I'm going to come up here and literally, I'm just going to sort the delta time. What that does is it's going to show me where is the maximum amount of time between any two packets in this whole thread. Where is the weight coming from? So if I click it once, it's going to put the fastest times at the top of the list. If I click it again, now I'm going to I'm going to hit these green buttons up here. You see these green left, right, jump to specific packet, jump to top, jump to bottom. Let's jump up to the top. This is going to take me to packet number 51. And here in packet 51, I've got 808 milliseconds between this packet and the one previous to it. Yeah. And this was a window update. Interesting. So, ooh, I also see another indicator here. TCP zero window. All right. Let's go ahead and take a closer look. So I sorted delta time to just find the slowest packet here in the the PCAP, or, or rather the, the, the delay, the biggest delay in the PCAP. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put this right back in order. And here I can see packet 51 is where the biggest cause of delay is for the whole trace file. Compared to 25 milliseconds, David, yeah. let me ask you this. Yeah. 25 milliseconds, does a standard human worry about that much time? No. Nah. How about 808 milliseconds? Is yeah, that you, closer to what a human might feel? Yeah, you're going to notice that for sure. Yeah. And you'll especially notice it if you suffer it many times. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, one packet perhaps not so much, but if it happens a lot, right? Yeah. And so, and a lot of times, you know, when, when data is moving, if I'm downloading a file, if I'm uploading a file, if I'm interacting with an application, there's a lot of transactions that are happening. So it's not uncommon for an end user to experience that type of delay many, many, many times. Yeah. That's where delays can turn into many seconds or even minutes. Okay. So let's figure out what's up here. So packet 51, client is going to server with a window update. Notice the packet previous, though, client is going to server with a TCP zero window. Hmm. Now, these are the ones that I just love, David, because zero window, 100%, they're blaming the network. They're, 
<laughs> totally blaming the network and being slow. This problem has absolutely nothing to do with network latency. You, you could scrap your entire network, replace it with full fiber, 10 gig, endpoint to endpoint, and it would do absolutely nothing to resolve this issue. You've had that. I think you told me in a previous video, some client wanted to spend lots and lots of money or you saved them spending lots and lots of money or something because they were moaning yes. it was slower and then they wanted to rip it out or something, right? Yes. And a lot of times they'll first spend that lots and yeah. lots of money and then it's still a problem. And then that's when they'll call me. <laughs> and I'll say, hey, can I have some of that other lots and lots of money? Yeah. Usually that's already spent in the budget. But anyway, just buy training. Let's buy training instead of a lot of equipment. But what is it? What does it mean, like zero window? I hope, I'm hoping you can explain how you got to that conclusion. How would us normal people know that that means it's not a network problem? Yeah, let's let's dig into that. That's going into the fourth thing that I right. look for. So the, the the delay was the third thing, but let's go to the number four. And number four is these types of TCP indicators. So where is Wireshark if Wireshark is giving me these kinds of clues? So zero window, window full. So then I can start honing in on some of those alerts that Wireshark's actually trying to help me out with. It's like black and red, right? So that gives you a good indication there's a problem. Is, is that what you mean? Absolutely. Like, look yeah. here. In fact, over here in my intelligence scroll bar, this is like this micro scroll yeah. bar over here. You can see the coloring rules. And this is one reason why I like to change the color, the default colors to something a bit more bright. As I can see up on top, that's the beginning of my conversation. There's my bright green up there. I see a couple blue lines. That's my TCP, or I'm sorry, my TLS handshake beginning. Then stuff happens. And then I run into to trouble down here with these black lines. And at the very end, I can see, ooh, yeah. and then there were some resets at the very end. Okay. Now, with a glance, you can get used to even doing troubleshooting, just, just looking at that intelligence scroll bar. Okay. So what is going on here? Window full, zero window. So first of all, let me back up a couple packets. Now, one other thing that I'd like to talk to you about. So Dave, you know, at the beginning, we were talking about how packets don't lie. Yeah. Well, I hate to tell you that sometimes they do. You're And we see that. <laughs> I know. I know, right? <laughs> Hey, it's not my fault. I'm just the messenger. All right. So something I just want to get ahead of right here. You can see these larger packets. Now, yeah. let me ask you, David, as a network guy, does this look normal? Can you have these huge packet, can Looks you have packets big, that right? are this size? Yeah. yeah. In fact, what's usually the largest one we can have typically or what range? Yeah. So, I mean, is it typically Ethernet you, you're referring to like 1500? Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, that's, that's often what you'll see as yeah. a as a maximum around 15 1518 technically if you have the ethernet frame or if you have a, a, a vlan tag or something like yeah. that that'll extend it or if you're in a data center environment where you have jumbos not talking about any of those things clearly 20,000 bytes in the single packet breaks rules yeah just can't have packets that size so what we're actually seeing is what the packet driver thought it saw when things were either being transmitted or upon receipt this is either transmit like reassembly. stitching it together or something. Sorry, go on. That's exactly it. It's either, so sometimes what happens when we're capturing on the device that is involved in the conversation, Yeah. what can happen is our packets get captured before the NIC card chops them up. Okay. That's what happens. So it's TCP segmentation offloading. And we capture the traffic before that happens. <clears throat> or no, we see. can even yeah. receive a block of data and it gets reassembled and that's when it hits the packet driver. So if you ever look like you're capturing these packets that are just really large, yeah, it's very likely this is just a, a symptom of a segment, segmentation offloading or receive reassembly. So the point is, if we captured on the wire itself, if we install a tap in the network or, or captured off of a span port, we would actually see a bunch of small packets. Okay. Okay, so getting back to uh, where we were supposed to be with our windows. I don't want, sorry, I keep going on these uh, detailed tangents, David. No, it's good. So it's good because, I mean, it's, it, the problem is when, you know, Chris, this is real world versus a course, right? Um, or we imagine yeah. traffic. So it, I'd rather you just give it to us like the real world stuff. So go for it. Yeah. And maybe I'll ask that of the audience if you don't mind if I can. Sure. Uh, sometimes I go on those detailed tangents and sometimes people complain, get to the point, get to the point, Chris. Err. And sometimes people really like it. So you can just let me know what you think down in the comments. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the data coming in from the server right now. So here's a, a block of data coming in. Client turns around and you notice on packet 43, if you click it, packet 42 is being act. Yeah. Our little visual check mark there. So client is acting packet 42. More stuff comes in from the server. More stuff comes in from the server. Client acts. Then more stuff comes in from the server. Client acts. We start to run into to trouble. 
So let's go ahead and do this. TCP window full. So what this means is that this packet is filling the receive window on the opposite side. So everybody follow me here. Let's go to packet number 46. I'm gonna come down to my details and I'm gonna come down to calculated window size or regular window, it doesn't matter. There's no window scale. So we can go to the regular window, right click, apply as column. What that does is it shows me the TCP window size, the receive buffer on the client. So now check this out. Let's go up a little bit. I'm gonna come up here to packet 28. This is on the client, all right? So server sends data, or client's sending something, server acts, client says something, server acts. Okay, now server starts to send data. Okay, now check out the, the window size, 61320. This is the client to server. So the window size went down a little bit. It used to be 65535, now it's 61320. What that means is data is pooling in that receive window. It means that this is all the, this is the amount of space I have left to receive data. Yeah. Server says, great, here's more data. Thank you. But check out our window size. It just dropped. Yeah. Server, still sending stuff. Client, window size dropping. Server, still sending stuff. Client dropping, sending stuff, client dropping. You see 39K, 26K. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally we get down here, server still sending stuff because it still has some room. Come down to packet 46, everybody. I'm telling the server, I've only got 11,680 left in my TCP receive buffer. The server says, fine, here's 11,680. It exactly fills the window. That's why, and by the way, everybody, here's one of my little tangents. You probably are looking at a length field in your copy of Wireshark. That length includes all the headers. What you see on mine is the TCP segment length. So to get that, all you got to do is just come up here to, where are you? TCP segment length. And what you can do is just take that value, drag it. It's just, just above the sequence number. Drag it and drop it upstairs. And you'll get the same length that you see, or you'll see the same uh, amount of data. You see yeah. the same data point. Now I've got it twice now, so I'm just going to remove this column. But you can see why I like that instead of the full frame length, because that's the amount of payload that is in a packet rather than all the extra header information. So client says, okay, 11680, here's 11680. Now that fills the receive window of the receiver client, 2920. So it actually digested a couple of packets because we're dealing with 1460s. So to two 1460s would be 2920. So the client digested a couple of packets. Hey, server, you can send me 2920. Server sends 2920. Here's window full. Now client goes, ugh, I'm full. I'm congested. Stop sending. TCP zero window is, hey, server, stop. I'm dealing with something on my side. I can't, I can't bring in this data as fast as you're sending it. Right now, the server has to wait. Server can't do anything. It'd be like if I have a, a glass of water that's completely full and I say, hey, David, go ahead and send me some water. Yeah. David, you say, your glass is full. I can't send you anything. Yeah. It's going to spill out. It's interesting, though, because you said, you said originally the, the problem looked like in packet two, that it was on the server side. But here, it's actually the client that's got a buffer that's full. Yes, and this is where it's a bit of a combo problem, right? So the client's getting congested, but the client is also restricted to this non-scaled window. Because of the server. Because of the server. Yeah. So there's a few things in play here. So first I'll finish this part. So a zero window, so we go down to zero window. That's where we wait, we wait almost that full second. Yeah. And that's where we see our TCP window update happen. The, the, the client comes back and says, all right, server, I'm back up to 62,780. Keep resuming your data transfer. You can keep sending. Server's like, about time. Here's more stuff. And then the connection shuts. So of this, I mean, up to this point right here, this is the amount of um, total packets since the beginning. Uh, of the traffic that has occurred up to this point, we're only 1.333 seconds into this PCAP. Yeah. And if I'm going to do a little something, if I go just before these TCP window folds, and if I take a look at packet 48, in fact, I'm going to come up to 46. If I right click 46, I just say set time reference. So from 46 to the end, when we actually get a window update and we start moving data again, 894. So nine, almost 900 milliseconds. Yeah. So, so oh, if I just remove that time reference. So 
of this 1.3 seconds, the majority of it is waiting for the client to clear its window and to continue to resume data. Now, it would be really easy to beat up on the client here. So now let's move to the fifth thing that I do when I see things like this, is I like getting to root cause. I yeah. like figuring out, hey, wait a second, how do I actually fix this? It's one exactly. thing to capture it, <laughs> one thing to capture, it's another thing to understand, and then it's another to com to move forward and start to address root That's cause. That's why you get paid the big bucks, Chris. <laughs> no, just, <laughs> well, why do you have If anyone wants to pay me big bucks, I'm here for it. So there's two things in play, right? One, the client window's filling. That means the client is becoming congested. Yeah. But here's the thing. If I look at these other indicators up here, the beginning, the client has a pretty resilient TCP window stack. Uh, it wants to do, or it has a pretty resilient TCP stack. It wants to use larger packets, SAC permitted, window scale. So this server is basically clipping our wings, Yeah. right? It's uh, not giving us the ability to use more normal, more modern TCP implementations. So back to what you said, this server is forcing us back to the 80s. Yeah. The client is not good at 80s TCP. Oh, that's a good, I like that, yeah. Yeah. That's all. So I would say the client, although it's it's easy to try to blame it because it's it's suffering under these circumstances, let's go ahead and blame the one that's putting it there. So now I'm going to focus more on this server. So, so this is where- So the, the boomers the, keep blaming the Gen Z, but it's actually the boomers that are the problem in this example. Yes, exactly. That's what we'll say. It. Oh, it's just, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll let you say that. So the server here would be where I would focus my attention. And this is where I got a few things that I, also some other clues that I can look at here, David. First of all, you see this client, hello, look who I'm going out to, this server name indicator, connect.facebook.net. Uh, it's hmm. a Facebook problem, right? <laughs> right? So this is just a, just a web crawl, but it's interesting that here, this uh, so-called robust, very, very this should be a very powerful system, is coming back with this strange TCP behavior. So something that I might look at here is I'd really want to be interested in, is there anything in the middle yeah, proxy that is yeah. proxying me? Yeah. Is there something that's intercepting this? Is there something that's changing in the middle? So this is where I got one other clue that I haven't gotten to yet. And this is where things can get pretty deep in the weeds. If I just come up, up here to IP and I just like to peek at the time to live. So right here, I can see time to live is 64. What that means is that this IP part, either there's two things in play, either the time to live is wrong or being reset along the way, or it could be that I'm hitting a proxy of some kind. This packet was basically, it's advertising as if it was generated on my network. The reason? Yeah. Because time to lives usually start at 64, 128, or 255, that number. As we cross routers, that number goes down. So this number hasn't been decremented yet. So what I might want to do is just look at my gateway. Am I doing any kind of proxying? Is there something, can I get a capture on the outbound side, on the other side of the router? How is this Synac coming in? Is it coming in with a bunch of options and it's really coming from Facebook and then it's being proxied by some setting here locally on my gateway, then things are coming in and, and being adjusted there. So that helps me get to a bit more weeds in figuring it out. So what, to just take this away or to put a put just an absolute stamp on it, if possible, I'd love to have a server-side packet capture because that would tell me how things are actually leaving the server. Yeah. And if the server is truly letting this go with no options, I'd be like, okay, man, let's get into 2024 here. So <laughs> let's, let's get in the now. I doubt it for Facebook though, so... Exactly, right? So yeah. it looks like something along the way is reshaping this Synac. So that's what I want to look at. Am I doing anything on my network that would be reshaping this or proxying this? Or am I being unknowingly proxied in my service provider? So David, this is just an example of the packets don't lie. The purpose in showing everybody this one was to uh, talk about how these TCP settings can really change how the uh, application can behave. In this example, these are types of things that I absolutely have seen in the wild. Sometimes clients will come to me and they'll uh, have a problem like this. In this exact one, though, as I recall, I was this is a lab environment. This is something I was able to generate uh, using a virtual machine that was going through VirtualBox and connecting out to the internet. Uh, so this was a NATed uh, device, and let me show you how I know that. If I just come to packet number one, if you take a look at the client IP address, so that's source IP 10.0.2.15. If you Google that, 
you're going to see that that's a default address that can be assigned to a virtual NIC by VirtualBox. Now, uh, so that tells me on the client side, just as a clue, if I start to see something strange like this, on the client side, running a virtual machine, okay, now I understand some of the resource limitations, right? Maybe this virtual machine was just under-resourced. As far as the TCP settings coming in from the server, what I would do now is I would want to go past the point of NAT. I'd want to go external to that virtual environment and figure out, okay, were those settings actually coming from the server or was this Synac coming back from that server and then ha that web proxy or whatever was proxying that, virtually proxying that information as it came in, were those uh, TCP settings being stripped? Were they being adjusted before being sent to that client? So I showed you this to be able to see how these little settings can impact uh, application performance. And in this case, it just wasn't the network. This was a virtual setting on a host. So I shared this example just so everybody can see just a clean example of how these settings can impact performance. In this case, yes, it was this client that was running out of resource in that virtual environment. And I'd need to capture further to determine what those server settings were in that ingress synac. Yeah, I love it because, I mean, it, it depends how the company set up, right? Because it could be the security team that have mandated a proxy or management have mandated a proxy so that they can stop people going to bad websites or whatever the reason is. That's not necessarily a network engineer issue. It could be a security issue, but I like that. You know, it's just stop blaming people and just try and fix the problem. That's it. But that's why as network engineers, we need to level up and be able to capture the traffic. Yeah and be able to understand even things that are outside our domain. Yeah. So it's not just looking for ARPs or ICMP redirects or routing protocols that are doing some strange update, but capturing and leveraging TCP data and above up to the application layer and being able to find what symptoms and clues reside there to help us to, to point to root cause. Yeah, I think the days of network engineers doing peer networking are long gone. We have to go wider. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's something that that's another reason why I'm so passionate about packet analysis. And I want you to be able to do this as well. So I definitely invite the the good viewers to check out my YouTube channel. Yeah. I have a lot more content like this stuff where you can download the packet capture and follow along. Also, David, you and I have a Udemy course that we collaborated on and that's getting started with Wireshark. So if this was interesting to you, uh, please go check that out. But overall, it's just do it for yourself. You got to capture the traffic and work through the exercise of understanding what's happening. And then you can begin to develop that art of packet analysis too. Chris, thanks so much for sharing. You know, you, you could keep all this knowledge to yourself, but thanks for educating people and changing lives. Always, David. I love this stuff. Looking forward to coming back again if you'd have me. Of course. So for everyone who's watching, put comments below, things that you want Chris and I to cover. Otherwise, go and sub uh, to Chris's channel. Fantastic content there. As always, Chris, thanks. Thanks, David.